This video is an introduction to the probabilistic trend family modeling framework. And the emphasis is on modeling framework, where you try and design a model that essentially captures the trend structure in the three directions, development year, accident year, and calendar year. And not just the trend structure, but also the quality of the volatility about the trend structure. That becomes an integral part of the model. You might have remembered from one of the previous videos, the coin model, when you toss the coin 100 times, has a certain level of volatility around the mean of 50. <coughs> the roulette wheel also had a mean of 50. It was numbered 0 to 100, and it was a symmetric roulette wheel but it had much more volatility around the mean of 50. So the quality of the volatility about the mean, which in this case in PTF will be the trend structure, is also uh, an integral part of the model. Now in the previous video, we looked at a number of conditions. We looked at condition one, which was zero trend down the development years. Let me just erase some of this. So zero trend was condition one, condition two was a constant trend, and now we're looking at condition three. So data either satisfies one of these mutually exclusive conditions, zero trend, constant trend, no constant trend. If you had zero trend, then if you were in the extended link shelf family, you would just take the average of the incrementals. But then you would treat each development period as a separate problem, but it's not. They're not really separate problems. Why would you take just the average of each one? There must be a way of doing better by actually connecting or relating the development periods. Similarly, under condition two, most times you will just measure the constant trend in the incrementals down the development year, but then you would be treating every period as a separate problem. Well, it's not a separate problem. And of course, condition three says, well, we don't have a constant trend going down the development year, and that's usually as a result of the calendar year trends not being the same. So the ULOF module, in a way, will create the bridge to you using the probabilistic trend family modeling framework, where there you try and identify a model or build a model for your particular triangle. Now, we did mention early on that no two companies are the same. And no two companies are the same in the industry. And by that, I mean you can look at two lines of business, <coughs> even perhaps even written in the same territory, because the two companies don't write the same mix of risks. The trend structure won't be the same, and neither will be the volatility, the process variability around the trend structure. Now, forecasting the future can be likened to driving a motor car. The windscreen is opaque. <clears throat> the windscreen is opaque. You're the actuary statistician. You sit in the back seat. You look out the back window, and you tell the driver where to go. If you have a straight road, you'll tell him to continue straight, but you're not uh, uh, necessarily sure. If you look out the back window, and the road is changing directions haphazardly, and you don't know where you are, it's very hard to tell the driver where to go. And some people say, stop, only if you want to be liquidated. That's in the loss reserving context. So what do I mean by straight road? I mean a stable trend. If you've had a stable trend for many years, then many years ago, you should have been able to obtain the same reserve estimates as you do today, statistically. And you should have been able to forecast the volatility in the last five years you've left out. If you have an unstable trend, then you need to study the nature of the instability and what perhaps causes it to try and figure out a forecasting scenario for the future. But all forecasting assumptions that you make about the future are explicit. They can be related to the volatility in the past experience. Whether you have a stable trend or not has nothing to do with the volatility of the numbers or the volatility of the ratios. A triangle has three directions, development year, accident year, and calendar year. You're actually sitting with your motor car here. <clears throat> Next year, you'll drive the additional mile, and you'll be there. The future is in that direction. 
the past is in that direction. Now, let's do some exercises that one would do perhaps at school. You can consider this almost as being an IQ test. You remember at school you used to be given a series of numbers and you had to forecast the next number or by looking at the patterns in the numbers or you were given a series of numbers with a gap and you had to interpolate. If I only give you these numbers in the first development year and suppose you are at the same mix of risks every year and I ask you to forecast the number in the next underwriting year suppose when the next underwriting year you're going to write the same mix of risk and the same volume of business how would you do it? Well one thing you can do is graph the numbers versus the accident year and you graph them and they seem to be around the same level trend and you need to forecast the next one. So if you fit a line, which is close as a flat line, as close as possible to all the points, that's basically the sample average. So your prediction for the next year would be the sample average. But apart from having a prediction, which is a sample average, arithmetic average, you'll also have an idea of the volatility. And therefore, you'll be doing this on a logarithmic scale. You'll also be able to say, yes, that's what I'm going to observe on the average, but the outcome could be also a certain distance. You could put a long wall distribution here. Suppose the observations around the flat line were normally distributed. You could actually predict a distribution here with the mean being the average. Similarly, this is all done on a log scale. Similarly, if I only gave you these numbers, and you wanted to forecast these few here, well, you could graph them, but you notice that there's a decay. There's a negative trend. Well, again, you could predict these three numbers on the trend line, but you will also have an idea of their volatility because all these numbers in the past sort of are normally distributed around that trend structure. Okay, let's do another example. Suppose instead of giving you the first development year only, we give you the first two. And I ask you to predict these two values and that value. Now you graph the first development year, which is development year zero, and let's call this development year one. And when you graph development year zero, you find that there is a trend, in fact, even after you've adjusted by your favorite exposures. And it looks like that. So you'd project that value there on the trend line, but you also have an idea of the volatility around the trend line. When you graph development year one, so this is development year zero. When you graph development year one, there's also a trend. But you notice that the two trends are the same. So this trend is the same as that trend. So the only difference is the intercept. The intercept, so let's suppose this trend line is A1 plus B, not B, well, let's call it, okay, B, but it's not the same as the ratio. It's a trend here. By accident here, this line is A2 plus the same slope B by accident here. These are accident years here, okay? Now, if you fit those two lines in Excel, the difference between A1 and A2 would always be this difference. And given that A2 is less than A1, it basically would represent this downward trend. So in this particular case, not when you only relate the numbers going down this way, down the development year, but you'll, sorry, down the accident years for each development year, but you'll be relating the numbers in that direction also, if you were to do that. Of course, a triangle has lots of numbers and it's got three directions. So what you're going to try and do is capture the trend structure in the three directions and the volatility around the trend structure. And that kind of makes sense. So here's a triangle of numbers that I made up myself. It's just based on the exponential curve. Alpha is 11.513, so that the exponential of alpha is 100,000. What's going on in these numbers? What's the picture for these 90-odd numbers? Well, on the logarithmic scale, it's just a straight line with a decay of 20%, slope of minus 0.2. 
and it's the same for X, every X and G. So instead of going to my CFO with 90 odd numbers, a model is a picture. If you like, it's a story. And this picture here is just one graph. It's the same for every X and G. So for every X and G, we have a uniform decay of 20%. And each year starts with the same value. We're now going to add more trends to these numbers. So on the log scale, we're going to add a 10% calendar year trend for these four years. A trend on the log scale is a straight line. 30% between those years and 15% thereafter. What happens to the numbers now? What happens to the numbers now is actually axiomatic. It's true for every triangle. It's true for triangles in your company. What happens now to the numbers? Let's find out. When you go from this development year to the next, in 1978, you are going to the next calendar year. And as a result of that, that 10% trend along the calendar years projects along the development years. It manifests itself along the development years and also along the accident years. So now we calculate resultant trends. For these development years in 1978, the resultant trend is minus 20 plus 10, which is minus 10. From there to there, the resultant trend is minus 20 plus 30, which is plus 10. It actually goes up. Along these development years, the minus 20 plus 15 is minus 5. When you go to the next accident year down, the 10% trend must be there. But you can imagine for the next accident year 79, that 30% trend kicks in one development year earlier. So if we now look at the first six years, a graph, which you can do in Excel, in a spreadsheet, they look like that. This is the first accident year, 1978, plus 10, minus 5. The plus 10 as you step down the accident years is always one development period earlier. What happened to 1983? Let's check it out. 1983 is already gone for the 30% change, and the development year trend here would be the minus 20 plus the 15, which is minus 5, which you can see there. Now, what are the resultant trends going down the development years? Let's find those out, because we have condition 3 here, calendar year changes. When you go from that cell to that cell, same development year, next accident year, but it's also the next calendar year. That must be 10, 15, 15, 15. This trend is 30, then 15, 15, 15. These trends are 10, 10, 10, 30, 15, 15, 15. If you look at the graph of the data, if you select development year 7, as you step down the accident years, it's always 0.15. If you select development year 4, it's 0.3, then 0.15. If you select development year 1, it's 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.15. So, let's see. What's the relationship between this cell and that cell? 10%, 30%, 15%. In fact, I can navigate through the whole triangle from one cell to the next cell, and I know I can navigate around that trend structure. So I'm actually relating every number in the triangle. I know the relationship between that number and that number. Okay? I would have to move down the accident years and back along these development years, and I'll know how to get there. Every time I go back that way, I know it's, Minus 5%. That's how I add a 5%. I know the relationship between that cell and that cell. It's a plus 10%. Then I know these are minus 5. Then to go down here, it's 10, 10, 10, 30, 15, 15. So I can navigate throughout the whole triangle. Now, what we're going to do is add random numbers from a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 0 0.01 or standard deviation 0.1 to those um, okay, what we're going to do, so we've done that, and that's what each 
of the first six years looks like. And now we're going to try and model these numbers and what are going to be our expectations. Let's see what our expectations are going to be. If we model the numbers that randomly deviate from the true trends, which we, this will actually we're going to be doing this in the next video, what are our expectations? When we estimate that trend for the random numbers that deviate from the true trends, and we know the true trends, we'll have a, get an estimate of around minus 20, around 10, around 30, and then an estimate of around 15. And when we'll do our projection, we'll assume that the future trend is around 15%. Let's suppose instead we took our motor car back four years. We were sitting at the end of 87. We didn't have these data points. What information can we extract from the data? We could estimate that trend, which is still around minus 20. That one is still an estimate of the 10. That one would be an estimate of the 30. And the trend from 83 to 87 would still be an estimate of the 15, so it'd be close to 15. So one would argue that the end of 87, when you project the reserves beyond 91, you should get statistically the same answers for the reserve distributions as you would get at the end of 1991, because you're making, if you like, the same trend assumptions and the same volatility assumption around the trend structure. However, if instead, we make it a little bit more complicated. You were sitting with your motor car there in 1983. Well, you wouldn't know anything about the 15% trend. However, you'd have an estimate of the minus 20, the 10, and the 30. And the estimate of the 30 will be much larger than 10. So what trend do you use for the future? Well, you need to try and investigate why is there a trend of 30 which is much larger than a trend of 10. Suppose it's new legislation, and you studied the new legislation, and you worked out by studying it that its impact is only a one-year impact. Then what you are likely to do is revert to the estimate of the old trend, which is an estimate of the 10. So at the end of 1983, because the legislation usually is a one-year impact, it's not 30% thereafter every year. Therefore, you will probably project using the 10% assumption, and it's explicit, and you can relate it to the past experience. Of course, by the time you get to about 1984, 85, when you've got more data, you might find that the estimate of the 10 is a bit light, and you'll veer more towards the estimate of the 15%. And in the next video, we're actually going to take this triangle, where the numbers deviate randomly from the two trends, and we know the two trends, and we're going to model it, and so on. Okay, thank you.